I know when I went to China, I started reading some of the books about cultural awareness, things you need to be aware of when you're doing business in China. And maybe after seven or eight years, you realize half of them are not important, that they're, they're more sort of myths than reality, but there's probably half are important, and whether it's in business or in, or in personal life. Um, so I'd say, yes, it is important. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know them all, but at least if you have some sensitivity and awareness to the cultural differences, that will be, uh, that will be respected. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind is just that it is a very uh, hierarchical culture. So, especially in the, in the business organisation, uh, when you go into a business meeting, uh, who you're talking to is really important and people will still sit in order. The boss will sit here and then the next subordinate there, the next subordinate there, and the subordinates won't speak until the boss has spoken and, and all of that. Um, so I guess maybe in, maybe in your world, if you're a tourism operator in Queensland, if, if you're dealing with Chinese tourists, maybe it's times of difficulty, just bringing the manager in or bringing the senior person into the discussion can be really important, even if they're saying exactly the same thing as the person on the front desk. Just the fact that the manager, the senior person has, got, uh, has become involved it does become... Uh, quite important for them. It's interesting following on from that point because you know we've done some work up at Tangaluma Resort and Tangaluma Resort the resort manager there was telling exactly that story and he's saying that you know for you know when there was an issue or a problem you know the staff used to come up and say oh could you come you know there's a bit of a problem could you come and tell them that we can't do something or whatever and he was saying for about three months he used to say well I'm going to give them the same answer that you gave them so really probably won't add any value to the discussion. Um, so, you know, no, I won't bother. And they kept trying to explain this point that, you know, sometimes just bringing in the senior person, just the fact that you do it, people go, oh, so the senior person's involved. OK, well, there must be nothing you can do about it. And they're quite happy. But, and so he finally, he gave in and he went and he did it. And the first time he did it, this group that, well, a group of people that was going, you know, we're not happy, we're not happy, basically just went, oh, okay, thanks very much, and walked off. And he said, and from there on, he realised the importance of just the fact that he got engaged in the, in the discussion at all had this fundamental difference because seniority matters. Well, uh, I just wish to um, echo what um, Bernard just said. Um, you could do all that, that much you could do, um, but... Um, it, it's always helpful if you have that um, basic awareness. Um, and, and, and example, still the, the hotel industry. Um, often when we have high-end groups coming in, they will specifically request the room numbers not to be ended in uh, the di digits number four and number seven. Um, things like this. You, you, well, that's when um, your ITOs come in handy because um, we all know about all, all these sort of um, weird requests and um, hierarchy, for example, um, the n number one important person would need to be accommodated on the highest floor, whether or not you place all his subordinates on level one and he on the level seven, you have to um, satisfy what that, um, uh, what, what that request comes from. And um, there's an interesting, um, it always happens when people are organizing um, the event for, for um, Chinese, um, sometimes you put some decorations on, on um, the desk, uh, sorry, the tables, and it happens many, many, many times that uh, some kind of paper money will, will put on the, the table. That, that's... Um, that's uh, something very easily accessible in um, any Chinese supermarket. Um, and they may look very good because they look all golden and sometimes red. 
Um, however, those paper money are for uh, funerals for, for dead people. So um, if you don't know about that, um, just trying to organize some, something special, um, better to consult with someone who knows about it. It's two points in there I want to just follow up on one's numbers. All right, so in Chinese everything's written with characters and characters have meaning. Numbers have characters, therefore numbers have meaning. So while we say 13 is unlucky because, and that actually goes back to a story about Judas and blah, 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 in Chinese these numbers, so the number four, the character for four, actually means death. That's, that's what it means. So it's a bit more than just saying it's an unlucky number. You're actually saying, you know, it's, it's a death number. Yeah, so that's not good. Yeah? Um, but, you know, there are other numbers like eight that are very, very lucky. So, again, if you're pricing, you know, 64 is not a good number. 68 is quite okay. 88 is fantastic. You know, 98. Nine means you'll stay together for a long time. So nine, ninth of the ninth is the best for weddings. So the ninth is a wedding month. Six means things go smoothly. Yep, so again, there's a few of these numbers that actually mean things. And you ask, you know, do they matter? Um, and I think that, you know, the best examples that I have are where people say, if you could avoid it, you'd avoid it if you could avoid it. And I had somebody who used to tell me they had a motel and they had um, their rooms, their high-end rooms were in wing four. And after coming and discussing what we were discussing about numbers, he'd changed those wing to wing eight and he hadn't had a book, Chinese booking in, the, in that one room. He thought it was because it was more expensive uh, for three years. And when he changed it to the eight block, he got seven within the first week. So do numbers matter? Yeah, I think they do, yeah. And the other one is colours. So colours are important as well. So colours for you know, gold. Gold's the best colour you can have. Yeah. So again, but again, gold, but not on paper money, okay? So paper money's not good, and gold paper money is even worse because that means wealth in death, which isn't good. So we don't want that. Um, but what you have got is you've got colours like white. White's, a, white's the funeral colour. So you avoid, again, white. If you can avoid white, you know, and use gold. So even in gift wrapping, even in ribbons on presents, even on all those things, if you can try and incorporate gold, that's good. Yellow's okay, but not yellow writing on things. So again... There's rules within rules, but generally speaking, white's a bad colour. All right, black's, black's not bad, actually, but you shouldn't use it for too much. Um, red is really, really good. Red's the lucky colour. And red's also a psychologically proven comfort colour. Every fast food, food chain in the world is red. Think about it. Red Rooster, KFC, McDonald's, keep going, doesn't matter. All right, it makes people feel good. Feels, make people feel like things will happen well, as well as that it's got, it's got luck and prosperity with it. So gold and red together. So McDonald's might have been Chinese, I reckon. Um, they worked out that you know, that's fantastic prosperity through good luck. So there you go. So colours. You know, colours are important. Numbers are important. Yep. And again, you know, if you're handing room keys, if you can avoid the fours, that's good. In hotels in China, you won't find a fourth floor. You'll find a 13th floor. And for those of you who run any kind of helicopter tours, one of the biggest things we've found out is most helicopter tours in Australia are run by SF-44 aircraft. And they have SF-44 in big letters right on the side. So when you're asking some guy of 70 who's very superstitious to go up in a double death box, you're in big trouble. Okay? So again, be careful, yeah? Andy, um, we were asking about cultural awareness stories. I'll let you talk about your idea. Of, uh, can you tell us what you think about cultural awareness and important things? Um, very interesting stories. I think in terms of a uh, cultural awareness is that uh, the Chinese, and very often that when you speak to them, um, and that some of the icebreakers, people ask me, you know, what are the good icebreakers? Um, and even though people call me Andy, uh, I'm not really Andy. That's not my, my, my name, because you know that being a Chinese person, Andy is not, a, not um, a Chinese name. So one of the icebreakers that I always tell people is that ask about their Chinese name because every single Chinese name has meaning. And they're all different. They're all unique. So for me, it's happy days. And I think for Cheryl, I want to let Cheryl explain that. So it, the name carries a lot of you know, the thinking by the family around uh, what they would like this person to become. And it means very personal to them. But I think it also shows that you understand just one step beyond the Stevens and Cheryl's and Michael that you see on the name card. Uh, so that's something that I would suggest that if you really want to establish some kind of good friendship and a relationship, you can ask about the name. And I think that's, you probably will know more about the person than, uh, 
than just reading the name count. And I think that's, that's a really important point when we talk about, you know, a lot about doing business in China is about relationships. It's a, we, they say a lot about you build a relationship and then the business comes. So it's relationship first, contract second. Whereas for us, you know, Westerners, we sign the contract and we build a relationship. So, you know, if you're talking about how do you build a relationship with somebody, well, normally you'd ask them questions about, you know, themselves or who they are. So this is fantastic when you meet someone, you know, and you can start saying, well, uh, you know, that's good. What does your name mean? You know, so, and their name will always have a meaning. And then you can say, well, where are you from? You know, and, oh, that, is that a big city? Where is it? So you can ask them all these questions. So, in fact, the first questions you should be asking are personal questions, not business questions. Now, this is one of the hardest things in all the time I have with Australian people. When they meet Chinese people, they want to go, hi, how are you? Blah, 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 blah. And all they want to do is start talking about, have I got a deal for you? Yeah? But, you know, look at my business, you know, you know, invariably. And even at trade shows, you know, people, you got a 12-minute appointment and people work out 11 minutes about talking about themselves. And my comment is if, you, you know, if you're an RSVP and went on a date and on the first night, on that first date, everyone spoke about me, 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 I, 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 you probably wouldn't want a second date with them because you'd say, well, you're all about you. You're not about the relationship. Yep. And so these ideas, they're great icebreakers. These ideas of being able to ask them where are they from, because, you know, again, they take great pride in where they're from you know, and their name. So my name is Li Jiaxia, which means man of substance, which I used to be much bigger and I was sure meant fat bugger, but it doesn't because um, it actually means solid wood. So I used some people. and Again, the meaning was solid wood, which means that you, you've got strong presence. So, you know... There's always a meaning behind it, and invariably, too, that meaning will give you some indication to the personality of the person. So, again, it, you should never underestimate what someone's given, had the name that they've got, because they actually end up being a lot like that. So, it's quite funny, isn't it? And it sort of brings us, I suppose, into things like business cards. And, uh, again, one of the big things about, you know, Asia and about China is the use of these things. So, these things are really, really important, yeah? They're an extension of somebody's persona. They're not just a piece of card. And I think, you know, in Australia, we're just not used to them, so we don't think about it like that. But, you know, this is who I am. It represents what I am, who I am. And when I give it to you, you need to treat it with some respect and care. So, uh, again, you know, business cards are really important things. Um, my biggest tip, don't write on the back of them. Writing on the back of them means you want to stab me in the back. I don't like that. Yep. Don't put it in your back pocket, because I don't like you sitting on me later. Yep. Those kind of things. It, they seem silly, but they're big things. So, again, with business cards, have you got anything you want to add on business cards? Uh, I'd just say it's, um, it's certainly real. Maybe, you know, doing business in Australia, the nature is you grab the business card, quick glance, and toss it on the, toss it on the table. No, over there. Take it in the correct way and then look at it, read it, study it, even if you linger and pretend you're studying it for a little bit longer. That's good. And then formally place it down in order with all that, uh, all that due respect. It is um, really important, something, uh, something I learned, and I think that's a good, um, uh, a good thing to do. And you've got, you want to add anything on business cards? Are you okay? Uh, I think business card is okay, yeah. Okay, quick question. Can I just ask a question? With, in terms of when you meet somebody, yep. uh, what's the protocol about women shaking hands okay. with people? Okay, we're, we're touching them one second. I want to show you what you do with cards as well, all right? Because um, it is important. The, the thing that I taught myself, which I think Bernie just spoke about, is what I call the pregnant pause. It's, I had to teach myself to do it because I tend to talk a lot, so stopping was hard. But when you get one of these, actually read it. And what you find yourself doing is when you get it, normally Australians go, thanks very much. Yeah? But if you actually look at it, what happens is if I get this card, I've got to go... Richard Beer, Managing Director, Fast Track Asian Solutions in Haven. Now, automatically, I've got, oh, so Richard, you're Managing Director of Fast Track Asian Solutions. Oh, what do they actually do? Oh, where's Haven? You see what happens? This thing starts to give you non-business questions and relationship questions, and it shows that you took the time to read it and care. And so I call it the pregnant pause. I think it's something that we have to learn, you know, when we're dealing with Asian. And you get that card... If you take the time to read it, you have to stop. And that small stop time is the time that actually you're showing respect to the person that you got the card from. And so when you get the card, if you watch other people, the Chinese people, they'll do the same. When they get it, you know, you're, still, you're normally trying to talk while they're still trying to read. So 
Yeah. So do you want to try? I'm going to try and do. Every time I do this, people don't know whether to shake hands first, add a business card first, do anything first. So I'll try and do it with Andy. This hasn't been rehearsed. So I hope it works. I'll, 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 um, I'll jump in yep. in the business sure. card. Sure. Um, when you go over to China to do some sales course, and that we know. China is the most densely populated country. You go in an uh, uh, office building, there may be hundreds or thousands of people there, um, and you may meet uh, 10 people or 20 people at one time. If there's someone um, that you've seen and they didn't give you business cards, that does not necessarily mean that they're way too junior and their company didn't print them business cards. They may be um, th that whole department's um, head of that whole department or, or the head of the whole company. It, it, it varies. Y yes, some may be very junior staff, but um, um, there may be some much higher ranked people amongst them, and they normally um, wouldn't give you their business card uh, in the first, first time you met. Some of them may be quite senior, but they're not telling you, so that's the other thing. Do you want to try, Andy, you want to try this? We'll see whether we can do it. So okay. normally, if you're going to just meet somebody, right, you walk up, you just go, hi, Andy, how are you? Right. Yep, so you'd actually do it, then you'd actually present your business card. Yep. All right, and then he'll normally give you one back if I'm lucky. But have you got one? No? Uh, I no. do. Okay, so normally, <laughs> you know, what people find really hard, it didn't work the way I meant to, but it's all right. But normally, <laughs> I'll give you one more. Yeah, I'll give you one, I'll give you one more instead. So oh, you can give me one back. <laughs> so anyway, what, what people find really hard is, Whenever we do this, they're like, oh, what do I do first? Yeah. And the answer is, you're still building a relationship. So it's like, it's always, hi, how are you? Then you stop, then you give them the formality of the card, all right? And then they'll give you one back, all right? And then that's when you actually have to, the pregnant pause while we're both reading. And then you go, oh, thank you very much. So if you're moving down the line, you just move to the next person. If you want to, oh, so Andy, you're, so that's when you start. So it's you still it's got to be natural. Hi, how are you? Still, you know, relationship. Swap the card. Have a look. Show respect. Understand. Start the relationship. That's how it works. Yeah. So does that help? Now, women, women still. The, sorry, I've been one of those things. Just, in in terms of women, it's not like Japan, etc., where there's sort of a difference. You know, the bar, if the boss is a woman, the boss is a woman. So, you know, it's basically the oldest person, the seniority is still going to be the most senior person. So they get treated with exactly the same way. So if you're meeting, coming in and meeting someone, you do exactly the same. The only difference is a woman, Chinese woman, back the way can give me a half handshake, not a full handshake, and that's, doesn't, that's actually quite acceptable. So that's the only difference. But the only thing is also... You know, Australian people, Australian men try and be macho and break bones, just be a bit more, you know, you don't try and break people's hands, right? You can just hold them and say, great. But So from a handshake point of view, everybody can handshake. Every, that's the common way of greeting. I, is that right? or? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the true rules are, but my experience was I had no issues with handshaking men or women. But what about a woman China. meeting a delegation, say, of men, Chinese men? There's no, there's no... No. Right. Unlike some of the other Asian cultures, yes. where you actually say, you know, men, you know, women and men, they don't have that. So, you know, it doesn't mm. work like that in China. I, I certainly had no, like, rejection. I, I don't think I remember seeing too many Chinese women shaking hands with each other, but that's okay. When it comes to, especially a Westerner, I think they expect that, because that's just the way we do, and that's, that's okay. No, so I just get the hand out there and off you, off you go. Also, this issue about privacy. So, you know, because there's so many people in China, personal space is quite small, but private space is really important. So you don't come up and start hugging and how you're going and you don't do that. You don't come into my inner sanctum until someone invites you in. So the idea of the whole, you know, how you're going and the hugs and all those kind of things, the idea is, no, just stick with the handshake because the handshake actually moves your point forward. It moves your personal space forward to shake and then you come back to take the card. So you're actually just meeting and coming out. You're not coming into my private space. So, again, the private space is very important. When you become good friends with people, when you really know your relationship's good, they'll actually ask you to do that. So they might then let you. You know, like I can meet Cheryl now and I can go hi and hold, shake her hand and, and tap her on the shoulder. That's... I think it's still, that's okay. It's sort of acceptable. The first time I um, really 
really give him a big punch when he did that. Yep. I just want to support um, w w what you guys have just talked about. Um, actually, the Chinese government encouraged the equality bet uh, of the both, both of the sexes. Um, uh, women, after marriage, you have to keep your maiden names. Not, you're not you're not to um, take up your husband's um, surname. So, and, and it's very common to handshake. That is the only way I would say that is the only way recommended, not the, the hug, the, the kiss, they will, that's not very common anyway. And so I suppose the other one that we've heard a lot about today is face, so Chinese face, and everybody talks about, you know, China, sorry, Sandra, sorry, yep. Yep, yep, go on. Yep. You have a Chinese name. Yes. So when do you earn the right to put your Chinese name on the um, business card? By having a good translator. You can do it straight away. Okay. Yep, I mean, my name is, you know, so the difference is translation should never be about words, they should be about meaning, and that's another issue that you've got to understand. So, you know, it's, my name's Richard Beer, my Chinese name is Lee, so. B and Lee, beer and Lee, they don't, it's not a translation, it sounds reasonably close, but the two other names that they gave, the two other names made up who I am. So the Lee Jia Shi. So I asked someone to give, I asked people in China to give me a name and they said, based on who you are and your persona and what we know about you, we would recommend, we, would, we think this is, would tell people about you. So it's a name that actually reflects who I am as a, as a person and personality. So you can go and get it, but don't make the mistake of trying to say, I want something that sounds like my name, because you may end up with a meaning that says you're a rat bag, you know? So. Just wait a couple, wait for a while until you are entrenched into that. No, as long as you've got a few people around who can help, Cheryl could help give you a good name, Sandra. I'm sure. Also, I think it's a good name. Like, like a, well, no, sorry, we could, we could both work out my name, whether it's a good name. It'd be a change from Sandra. Yeah, I'd say go in straight away. So when I arrived in China, the, the marketing communications lady gave me a name because it has to go on your business card straight away. Um, so Bernard Hughes, she translated as, as excuse my tones, but as uh, Xiao Boina, which I think is the um, translation of George Bernard Shaw, the <coughs> author, so just a respected author. They sort of sounded a bit the same, plus was a respected name. But uh, then when I used it in front of my team, uh, my pronunciation wasn't so good and it was making it sound like something else that didn't have um, such good connotations. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't good. So I said, uh, you know, my pronunciation didn't get better quickly enough. So I said, look, just get me a new name. So I asked my team, you come up with a name that you think works better and I can pronounce easily. So they changed it to uh, Hu Bo Ning. So Hu, like President Hu Jintao, Hughes, Hu, sort of the same then. Morning sounded a bit similar to Bernie, so off we went. So just new business cards, new name, and off we go again. I think it's answering that question. Um, my view of this is that there's no need to wait before you get a Chinese name. And as soon as you have a Chinese name, then it shows sincerity and shows respect that you actually want to engage with China. And very often the Chinese understand that when you have a Chinese name, you don't expect them to call you their Chinese name, but it's more of showing that affinity towards a culture. Whereas for us, when we have our English name, it's really to facilitate that communication. But for China, people understand and they appreciate if you have a Chinese name. And I think between you know, having uh, just a translation or the sound translation versus have a bit of meaning to it, and that they can tell your, I uh, guess, you know, the level of, of deeper engagement with Chinese culture. So have a good translator to have a really good name goes a long way to make you stand out in China. And should you have both names, like the English name and the Chinese name on the card? I think I've seen the practice of um, both English and Chinese on one side, or Chinese on the back side with English on the front side. It doesn't really make a difference. Uh, in terms of whether you should do it either way, but sometimes if it's too crowded, then maybe consider doing the two sides. It's more common yeah. English on one side, Chinese mm. on the other side. The two sides would be more common. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just um, um, add on something from a female's perspective. I am, I'm totally with you, Sandra. Um, all you guys were saying that there's no, that there's, um, 
you, you, you can um, just get your Chinese name straight away um, and, and print, it, print it on your business card. I know where you, you're coming from because um, from a, a woman's perspective, you want to be you want to make it perfect before you want to road test it for a while, then um, see if everyone likes it, then I go for it. So the, um, the temporary way to do it is um, you can sound translate your name into Chinese. It doesn't have to, because uh, Chinese uh, normally have, an uh, average Chinese person normally have, um, has a name um, of two characters, three characters, um, very rarely have they have four characters. Um, but for Westerners, that you you don't know when or what to take up as your Chinese name with meaning, you can always do um, sound translation only your first name. For example, um, um, Sandra, you can just print. Um, Shandela, like that on your, so it's not, it's it, it's not. Um, the, people will know um, straight away that you are a Westerner, um, and along the way, when when you deal more with them, you want to change it to a, a more meaningful Chinese name. Go for it, but um, initially you can also do that when you're not a hundred percent sure. That's. Just, just check just that shangri la doesn't mean, you know, something that you don't want, that's all. <laughs> it still could be a problem. All right, um, face. We, we heard about face today and people were talking about Chinese face and there's lots of different things about Chinese face. But um, who's gonna, who wants to kick off the discussion on face? Andy? And I think um, the most um, prominent observation of Chinese and the need for the face is that you don't get a no from a Chinese person. And sometimes they will say yes, but they mean no. Sometimes they will say, I'll come back to you, which means no. And there's many different interpretations. And I think that is one of the most difficult, uh, I guess, a fact for many foreigners when they deal with Chinese market, especially when it comes to business deals. If you say the yes, why do you renegade? But very often that they will do that when they feel not comfortable to give you the answer. And if you push forward, they will say yes. It's never being offered in the first, first go. So if you can sense that they're thinking through what they couldn't get you an answer right away, and best not to push it, because if you push it, you get into uh, an area of potential miscommunication in the future. So. Uh, I think we, we talk about things, closed questions. Closed questions put people on the spot, you know? Did you have a nice time? If you didn't, there's nowhere to go. Yeah, black and white. Yeah, black and white's not good. So you should, the three things that we talk about to you know, avoid people losing face is to avoid conflict, avoid dispute, and avoid embarrassment. Avoid conflict, avoid dispute, and avoid embarrassment. And if you think open questions will never lead you. Black and white leaves somebody nowhere to go if they want the black or white. You know, you've got to get in the middle. So there's a grey zone, you know. So I think one of the things that we're very good at, we're very direct, we believe that if we ask direct and move directly through, we'll get to the answer. Chinese people want to go around it. They want to go around. They don't like confrontation. Right? Confrontation causes embarrassment or dispute for somebody, whether it's you or whether it's the other person. So I think sort of the, the three rules for me are if you think about, you know, wow, is what I'm about to do, could I put someone on the spot here? If I could put them on the spot, I've got to find another way to ask the question. So the other one is, you know, you know, how do you think that we could improve things for Chinese guests? Very different than did you have a good time here? You see what happens. You start to move the questions. You reframe, you reframe things. So in a lot of time, what they're not actually saying yes or no. They're actually reframing what they're trying to tell you. So you have to ask questions back. <laughs> so questions are good things. Sorry. Yes, over there. Um, in relation to face, um, dining Chinese, um, I had experience uh, over in China where the Western culture is to eat what's in front of you. Um, and that is uh, a way of what I believe was being polite, but we were informed that uh, the Chinese want you to actually leave something on the plate because they feel as if uh, um, they haven't fed you enough, so there was this, this, this uh, um, to and fro, and we would continue to eat and they would continue yep. to order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the worst, the, the worst one, 
Normally, normally you can get out of that one, but the worst one is, and most people's folly is, you've gone through the 12 courses of stuff that you didn't really like and you weren't sure of, so you haven't eaten a lot, and then they give you the bowl of rice at the end, and you finish the bowl of rice at the end. Now, the bowl of rice at the end is in case your host hasn't managed to satisfy you with all the delicacies that they've actually given you. So when you go, thank Christ, there's something I can eat, and go, ooh, and eat the whole lot, that actually means, wow, you haven't satisfied me. So your host is in a lot of trouble. You can expect a few more meals coming down the line. But um, anybody else got anything to say on that one? So it's not, it's, yep, you got a few, everybody's got these stories. Maybe just, just on face, the thing that I think is relevant for me is face in a negotiation. Um, so I found whether it's, personal in the shops or whatever or in business the Chinese love a good drawn out negotiation process I was a rubbish shy non-negotiator before I went to China now I'm a hardened negotiator and whether I'm at Woolies or Freedom Furniture I don't care I'm going to ask for a better deal um, so I think there's a lot about you know maybe if it's in your business if you're negotiating a price or a volume or whatever just being prepared to do that give a little take a little give something in terms of face in the negotiation, be prepared for a bit of a drawn out negotiation game, play the game a little, so start at a point where you know you can give a little and come down. Again, it's about relationships, it's not about getting the best price, it's about compromise. So you know, when people start dating, you know, men, you know, men start liking romantic movies and women start liking sport, that's what happens. You know, down the, as the engagement happens and as you compromise. So this is the same thing. It's about that. It's the art of relationship building. You know, it's not so much about screwing you on price. It's building a relationship. So that's what you're looking for. And I think it's about respect. You know, at the end of the day, it's about respect for others, respect for society, respect for elders and respect for self. And never ever respect, don't forget respect for self because you've actually still got to save your face as well in all of this. You don't give away the farm you know, just to try and give them face because, in fact, you'll end up losing it. So face, it's a very interesting, wonderful thing. Um, top tip, cultural awareness top tip, have you, have you got one? The importance of food in conversation. So when, when we meet up in Australia, we talk about the weather. We say, g'day, how are you going? Nice day, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but it's meant to change tomorrow or, you know, blah, blah, blah. They think that's really weird. How can you spend so much time talking about the weather? It's like... Uh, but I think the Chinese equivalent is, or my experience is, you meet, you start talking about food. So a standard greeting is um, ni trilama, like have you eaten yet? And then off, off you go from there. So just the importance of food uh, in conversation and culture, uh, rather than thinking that they're going to want to be interested in talking about the weather for, for five minutes. Just on that about food, I'm just wondering when... Um, you know, the Chinese visitors come to Australia, um, there's always, and it's probably a myth, you know, that they need to eat Chinese food, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner. What is the protocol with that? What, how has that changed now with, you know, becoming more modern but not necessarily more Western? I think, I mean, when we talk about, I, a lot of the work we do in service delivery for food is about, you know, if you think of Chinese people, everything goes in the middle right, and you've got shared plates. Now, if you think about that, that means that, number one, if I take something I don't like it, it's not sitting on my plate and I'm not embarrassed, so I don't lose face, right? If somebody, the leader really likes one of the dishes, they can have more of it and we can hold back, right, because we want to let the leader or the senior person give them face. So a lot of food's about face. So my one is, you know, would you like the myrtle-infused herb-crusted lamb, sir? Well, what is it? What does it taste like? How do I know what it's like? And do I want to pay 35 bucks for a plate of it that I might not like that sits in front of me that everybody then knows I ordered the wrong thing? So we don't make it easy to engage with food because we, don't, we serve it in singular plates, which leaves no option for people if they don't like it. So my deal is shared platters, put things in the middle, right? change the service delivery. They want to experience and sample Australian cuisine, but you leave them an alternative that could lead very big to loss of face and that therefore means that it's very hard to engage. And I used this last night at dinner. Um, so who likes Chinese food in this room? Who likes Chinese food? Who likes yum cha? Right, would you like to come to for dinner? No idea. You'll order the fried rice or you'll go somewhere else. 
That's three, that's four different types of dumplings. You've got no idea what I just said. But if I put, said I'm going to have four lots of dumplings and put them down, knock yourself out, the next time you're going to say, I'm going to be smart next time. When I go to the next restaurant, I'm going to be able to order Hamsu Gok because I know what it's like. Yeah? Because you were able. So give people the choice to try and they will buy. Give them the choice, the options to engage, they engage. So I think that the idea with food a lot, I think, is about the way it's served. It just leaves people, it's very difficult. And in fact, if you run a restaurant, what you'll actually see, in a lot of cases, eight Chinese people sitting at a table, they order eight different dishes, they get them and they chop it all up, then they put it back in the middle and they ask for eight new plates. So they actually do it themselves. And that and then means extra staff, extra time, extra problem, extra cost for the restaurant, and it actually throws everybody's service out. So it's, it, again, this is about understand, just thinking about, you know, the way in which they can engage with things and doing, and I think, think the other way all the time. I mean, if you go into the Japanese restaurant and there's 27, we were at dinner last night, there were five types of fish on the menu, and I said, well, what's the, what is it, what's the parrot fish taste like? What's the difference? And, you know, you try and get answers about, what well, this is a Harvey Bay scallop. Oh, that's not a scallop then. If it's not a scallop, oh, it is a scallop, but it, why is it different? Oh, because it tastes like different. Is it a scallop still? Yeah. Just think about, we use all these terms, Chardonnay, would you like a Chardonnay or would you like a, you know, a Pinot Gris? Well, I, I'm not sure, sure, I'm on white and red at the moment, you know. Um, what does it taste like? What's the difference? You need to explain. I, I think that's the big issue for food. So. I've got, a, I've got a tip. Um, one of my favorite topics is drinking uh, with the Chinese. If you are familiar with drinking with Chinese, you probably will uh, have a few experience with this whole bottom-up, that kind of culture. And uh, to a lot of Australians, they struggle, especially when you have a big glass of wine, how do you actually bottom up? And I think the, the, tip, uh, the tips I would give you is that, well, um, you don't have to fill it up. You know, I think it's more important to drink a small portion in, and put it this way, it's more important to have a small amount of the wine in your glass and drink all of it than have a quite a big glass and drinking just like, the, you know, the one third of it. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that when you do this kind of like, you know, toast, uh, normally the, the guest uh, or the host will raise a toast with you. You do a bit of a small like uh, 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 portion in your glass, bottom up, and then you do a reciprocal toast to him or her. And then once you do that, the remaining toast are not as important as the first few. So it's really about how do you get to the point where you pay the, you give the face of the host at the same time not get completely <laughs> drunk and wasted, <laughs> at, you know, for the night. Correct. So drinking's drinking's always interesting, man. It's a, you know, again, and it is. It's you know, it's one. You know, a lot of the time it's you know, one to me, one one from me to you, one from you to me, and then one that's equal. So if you can be good, you get to three. The third one means all bets are equal. Thanks very much. No more. We don't have to play this game. So you know, three three means we've gone through the challenge. So, so it's good. Sometimes, sometimes, but you've so look. Sometimes you won't get the option. But the other thing is, if look, if you're out with a, if there's four or five of you, I'm going to tell you the easiest thing in the world. Right? They will send someone into bat, and you've got to work who's going into bat for you. Because if you're senior, you can send in someone down the line as a front batter. Yeah, and they can get knocked for six. It's quite acceptable. It's quite acceptable to say, he's the heavy hitter, thanks very much. I'm, the, I'm in charge, I'm not doing that. Right? And you actually pull back, but you watch what they do, because I guarantee you, if you watch their side of the table, one of their guys will be the guy that's hitting up all of you hard and fast before the senior guy gets near you. And that's all about winning. So play the same game back. That's my deal, right? Given with... Um When you go to France, you don't eat French fruit gastronomic meals, five courses, three times a day for 20 days. You don't do it, right? So there's a, there's a normality to stuff. I want breakfast to get up and get some nourishment. I want something at lunch and in a dinner I'll have three or four courses and we'll sit around and have a good time and chat. That's exactly the same. So, you know, uh, when we say, oh, they don't like Western meals, no, 
if, you know, when you go, you probably wanted some Vegemite and you want to probably want a bit of toast one morning. Well, they probably want something that's, you know, a, you know, a bit of noodles one day. So it's, it's about, I think it's about balance and I think it's about understanding that there needs to be balance. It won't all be Western and it certainly won't be all Chinese. There's no, you don't need to be all Chinese meals, but you need to have a way of engaging people in how to eat. Uh, and that I, find, I reckon that even with the younger people, the biggest issue still is this idea of, you know, one plate for you, one dish for you, one plate, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a, I think it's a real challenge for people to be able to do what they have to do in societal norms and values. That's my view. Yeah, so mix it up. So uh, not only the cuisines, but then when serving Western meals, give the option of a sharing plate that goes in the middle. So... Australian guy opened a restaurant in Shanghai called Mr Willis. It's all Western food. It's steaks, it's roast chickens, it's whatever. But you have the option. You have it served as an individual meal or serve the steak as a sharing plate in the middle where it's cut up and everyone can, can have a piece. So that's just a nice balance uh, that's in between. So fish and seafood are really good, not just meat. Shines, where it shines, Queensland shines on me, where Australia shines.